I'm a pretty patient guy in my old age now. <laughs> I talk too much. Uh oh. Okay, we're rolling. Yes. All right, this is an interview at the New York State Military Museum, Saratoga Springs, New York. It is the 8th of February, 2008, approximately 2 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, your date of birth, and place of birth, please? Okay. My name is Dominic Solomon. And there's a little incident why I use the Italian name. This is cute if you want to listen to it. When I signed up for the draft, they sent us to a school in the area, mm -hmm. and I had to be a teacher for the lady was interviewing me, and I brought my birth certificate along. So all my life, going all the way through high school, I used the word Dominic, spelled Dominic. So I put my uh, birth certificate on the table. She looks at it, she says, you're not Dominic, you're Domenico. <laughs> So, with this frame of mind, you're going into the yard, blah, blah, blah. I said to her, what the hell is it? And she's telling me my name is Domenico. So, from the time of that date, on my, and the, what do you call it, card, I was Domenico. So, I used that till I got out of the yard. Mm -hmm. okay. So, from that time till today, any official paper, I used the word Domenico. Okay. And that there is my grandfather's name. You know, among the European traditions, mm -hmm. the firstborn right. is named after the grandfather. Yep. Okay. As a, just because of that, I had a first cousin in Italy, who was my father's brother. He had his first son was male, and he was a Domenico. So anyway. Now, where, where and when were you born? I was born in Manhattan, in a little Italian neighborhood. And uh, just to make it interesting to people, Mayor LaGuardia, at the time I was going to school and all mm -hmm. that, he was the congressman from that district. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, just to give a little thing about Italian, there was a little Italian enclave there. I used to call it a ghetto. <laughs> and I'll explain to you why if you're interested. Those houses were tenement houses, they call no bathrooms. We had no shower or nothing. So when us guys growing up, there was a bunch of kids used to get together, and we used to go to the public baths. If you brought your own towel and soap, it didn't cost you nothing. If you had no soap or towel, and you had a few pennies of dime or five, I don't know what that would cost, you go in there and take a shower. So that's the kind of neighborhood that I mm -hmm. was born in. The, the address of the building that I was born in was 342 East 113th Street. Now that was right off the East River, because mm -hmm. Manhattan is broken in half. Fifth Avenue is the dividing yeah. line. You go towards the East River, it's East. Everything is uh, 113 East. Mm -hmm. I was born to a few were uh, living. The other side of Fifth Avenue was 113 West. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. And now, that, um, when were you born? December 28, 1916. Okay. Now, how much schooling did you have before you went into service? I had, I was lucky enough to be for a high school graduate. Okay. That came in very handy. I'm going to tell you why. You want to answer? Sure. I go in there. Basic training. And one after one evening, right after supper, they call all us guys. Just at the time I went in, this is cute. That's cute to me. I don't be interested. December seventh, nineteen forty-one. Mm -hmm. I was still had my draft card. Right when the Japanese decided to. Now, do you remember where you were when that happened? Was that the, Pearl Harbor? Pearl Harbor. Uh, the nearest I remember on a Sunday afternoon, I used to meet with a, one of my boys. We used to go to a movie or something. Mm -hmm. that's, that's when I heard a lot of happened mm -hmm. that I remember. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to go and meet my friend Pat, and we were going to go to a movie that afternoon. Okay. 
Now, when you went into service, did you did you were you drafted or did I you was enlist? Drafted. You drafted. Okay. Okay. Now getting back. Yes. We go into. Uh, I for, okay by Dece by January twenty second of nineteen forty two, I was drafted already. I was at Fort Dix, and uh, they took my mother. I got sent to Fort Belvoir. That's the Army Engineers. Mm -hmm. Now, did you have to take any tests or anything? Is Not at that. I'm just going to get into that. Okay. But that's where work comes in. I had graduated high school about 10 years before that. Mm -hmm. I graduated uh, uh, from high school around 19, I forget, 35, 36. Now, that one the week. Eight week basic training. First, they used to have more than eight weeks. When the war started, and I'm in Fort Belvoir, the first thing they told us, we're cutting the basic training down to eight weeks. I don't know what the hell I had my mind. What the hell could I learn in eight weeks? <laughs> so, to make a long story short, they called a bunch of us guys out, called this name, that name, that. And then, after they take us into a room, and they say, the reason you guys are here because you all have a high school diploma. So then they had an officer up there talking to us. He said, the Army is looking to the Army engineers. We're looking for people who could, we could use in different parts of the Army engineers, such as water purification, map reproduction, blah, blah, blah. We're looking for guys that could do that kind of work. So from that interview and that few tests that they gave us, they put me into what they called the heavy equipment school in Fort Belvoir. They, they tried to teach us how to use a road uh, bulldozer or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I was in that school for three months after basic training. And I spent... Uh, three extra months in Fort Belvoir in the heavy equipment school. So you learned to ro operate all of the Well, archer. they try to teach us whatever mm -hmm. you could learn mm -hmm. in three months. I don't know. It was a different than basic training, you know. Mm -hmm. they, one of the things they did, I remember, they brought us to an area that was like a wooded area, and we had to build a road. Naturally, had the guys with the non comms that showing you, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, how good you became was uh, your ability to uh, learn to use a... I'll be honest with you, the first machine they put me on, I wasn't doing with that. <laughs> yeah, coming from a city, what the hell did I know about? Now, did you drive a car at all back then? I had learned how to drive and I had my license. Because in New York City, you had to be 18 to get your permit mm -hmm. at that time. So when I went into service, I was a 25. You must have been one of the old guys in your unit then. Okay, I got a picture here I like to show. When we were in the Philippines, there was one guy in my outfit, a little older than me. He was 35, and his name was Thomas, Pop Thomas. But then, uh, yeah, when you compare it to all the mm -hmm. guys all around me, I was older than that. Yeah. So the fact that I had a high school diploma, I think, got me to go to a heavy equipment school. Mm -hmm. Now, where did you go after Fort Belvoir? After Belvoir, I, uh, they, they sent me to an outfit. I think at that time it was the 109th Engineers, which later became the 1118. Engineer Battalion. And then I moved around with the 1118. Uh, we stayed in the, the, um, the state police barracks. They put up a, an outfit for the soldiers on the state police barrack ground in Framingham. Spent about eight months up there. That was a good, uh, you could. Couldn't want a better town. Mm -hmm. Everything was, they were so good to you, you know. I, I, I was not of a heavy drinker, <clears throat> but if you went into a place, you didn't buy nothing. 
you know, mm -hmm. Framingham Mass. You were able to stay off base most of the time, or no? You... When we had a, uh, a pass, a pass for the mm -hmm. weekend, most mm -hmm. all those guys. Uh, it was easy to have a uh, make. Uh, now, what did you learn there? Did you do extra? Was that extra learning, or one of the things that? Well, they put me in that what they call a motor pool. So we used to put off wheels and grease and bury stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But and we used the state police barracks garage for the army. Mm -hmm. And on that piece of land, they built the. I was there long enough for them that they built barracks for the soldiers. We, we were living in tents all the time I was up there, till the barracks were built. And now those barracks were built while we were there, and uh, we finally got into brand new barracks. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, where, where did you go from there? Uh, to be honest with you, if I look at my discharge, in fact, I had to other papers got home. We got that from the outfit. All the places the 1118th had been to, I don't have it here, but if you look at my discharge page, I think there's more of a sequence of all the places mm -hmm. where. Mm -hmm. We went down to a couple of camps in uh, Virginia. Fort Belvoir was right outside of the Washington in, in uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Now, when, did, when were you finally shipped overseas? Uh, see, at that date, I don't remember. Well, you don't have to know the exact dates. Um, 43 or so? Or? Around that, I mm -hmm. guess. Because in 44, I was in the Philippines already. Mm -hmm. Now, were you, were you in on the invasion in the Philippines? or? I, okay. I was on a ship. We followed the 77th Division into Lady. And uh, while the army got off right away, uh, while the navy, uh, the infantry, I didn't get off the ship. The ship that took us into uh, Lady, if I get this right, I don't know. I think the name of the ship was a George Climber, a troop ship. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, on Lady, we didn't do too much uh, uh, road work or anything like that. What about uh, tropical diseases? Did you have any problems with malaria or dengue fever? No, the only thing I made sure <coughs> I took that low yellow pill. The adabrant? The adabrant? Yeah. I was one of those guys that if they said to do something, I did it. We used to take a pill. The only thing I could remember on my Fingers tiny yellow. Uh, I don't know I, if I should tell this little story. You know what the guys at GIs learned to do with that pill? Mm -mm. If you took an undershirt and took a pill and melted it, it turned that whatever garment you put in there turned yellow. You couldn't wash that yellow out of that shirt. Mm. Now, a lot of, the, it's, it's amazing what guys could do. Mm. They learned to take the because, you know, take their shirts and put a fad or something to put the damn shirt in the Atterburn and it turned yellow. <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard that. No, you know? no, no. That's a true story. Now, you mentioned in, in the form that you filled out that um, when you were on loading ships, you had to deal with salt water. Now, where, where was that? In the Philippines? The Philippines, yes. Now, what do you mean you had to deal with salt water? What? No. What happened, I think, to the army after they tried to go to uh, uh, where they go in Italy, where they had a lot of trouble getting uh, the, the equipment off the ships through the salt water. They took us to Florida for about a month, where we took army jeeps and trucks and made them so that they could run through water. Did oh, you ever see that? Okay. Yeah, you we, made uh, the, oh, all the yeah, to the engine. You had to take the engine and uh, put some kind of a putty all around the distributor, 
all around, the spark plugs all around. They showed us what uh, they wanted us to do. Put the intake manifold pipes all the way up, so that the, the, and then you had to run the machine that you wiped on through the water. But that was a, a, a takeoff on uh, when the uh, soldiers went to Italy. Mm -hmm. When they went to Sicily, I think. They had trouble getting the trucks off the landing craft and going through the water. Mm -hmm. They tried to make us do that with uh, six by sixes, uh, army jeeps. Now, did you ever do that when you were out in the Pacific? No, we did it in Florida. Yes, you trained in Florida. Trained I just wonder if you ever used that. Yes. Yeah. Before we got on the ship to go to to the Philippines, we did that. Oh, you you. All the equipment that we were uh -huh. was a, uh, attached to us. That mm -hmm. was part of mm -hmm. being the uh, motor pool. Mm -hmm. Now, when you got to Lady, what did you do there? We uh, ran a uh, what they call a dump where they, all the stuff coming off ships, we stockpiled it. And oh it. yes, okay. That's the supply the, depot. Like. Yes, yeah, supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, our outfit got to do most of that. Unload ships. Mm -hmm. uh, Were you yeah. ever under fire at all? I, the only thing I remember, maybe I'm making a story, when they had the big battle at sea where they defeated the Japanese, mm -hmm. they got us all, they lined us all up along the water as if, you know, it was gonna, we were going to be attacked by an invasion or something. That's, you know, but I never saw any Japanese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever carry a firearm at all? We always had the, uh, after I got in the, the regular outfit, they gave me a carbine. I didn't mm -hmm. have the, what was the 14 F was? What, what did the soldiers have? The, the M1. M1 carbine. M1. Yeah. So you had the smaller carbine. Carbine. Carbi. We always mm -hmm. carried the carbine. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I never had uh, any personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that one time, I remember them taking us out of that area where we were, you know, and bringing us to the beach and lining us all up, but I never saw any. Mm -hmm. But we unloaded mostly ships. Now, one story I like to tell, maybe this sounds like a story. When the 77th Division hit the beach in Lady, they were supposed to go through that Lady. It was like an island. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't make it to the other side. They were having too much... Uh, problem defeating the Japanese. They put a lot of us guys back on landing craft and took us around the island by boat. And we got to go to a, a town called Ormark, was on the other side of the lady. Mm -hmm. And then the 77th Division started from that point to go back to where we, we had started before. But I wasn't involved in it. Mm -hmm. The most we did was load, unload ships. Now, did you operate heavy equipment in unloading the ships, or no? Just, everything was by hand. Everything was by hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, the I, that's the army. By the time I got to the eleven eighteen engineers, there were guys there whose parents were in the construction business. They knew more about the damn equipment than I could ever learn. These are true incidents. Mm -hmm. I look at life that way. Mm -hmm. But they did try to teach us how to run a, a bulldozer, a road grader, uh, road building equipment. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do too much of that in my outfit. Now, when you were in the on Lady, what, what kind of living conditions were there? What kind oh, of tents? Tents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about your food? Was it uh, military food or did you get no. local well, food? The, no, no, no. All what the army said, ten and ones, where they got all those? The K rations. K rations, ten mm -hmm. and ones, whatever. Mm -hmm. Now, there again, a little luck. I was in 11, 18 engineers, but they, you know, they all had A company, A, B, and C. I was in the headquarters company. There was all the officers there. Mm -hmm. Now, 
our mess sergeant, I never forget his name, came from the Midwest someplace. His name was Grumdoll. But that guy was good, I'll tell you why, because I'm being Italian, we all kind of bragged that we could cook, you know. And uh, you know what this guy used to do with the K rations and stuff like that? He, if you had KP, you had open up all the cans, everybody ate from a big pot. Now that was great if you think about it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He so he put the, everything in a large pot and cooked large it together? Large pot, just like it was cooked. Uh -huh. When you think, of, I think about it now that I'm 90. That's, can you figure that? I thought it was great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jack. Are you going to edit that? Hmm. So anyway, that's a cute story, I mm -hmm. think. Yeah. You know, most outfits, say these guys used to heat their own stuff in a can. Mm -hmm. No. Dominic? Yes. Uh, I've heard this story before. Why don't you mention how you helped uh, one, of the, one of the commanders wanted ice cream? And no, no, the ice cream is a difference. That's a cute story, the ice cream. Now, one of the things that happened to us when we got to Aishima, we would... Now, this is from the Philippines you went to, to Aishima? Yeah, okay. because we followed the 77th Division, Division to mm -hmm. Okinawa. Now, Aishima, if you look at a map, was a small island that we could go to the shore, to the beach, and see Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Could look at it. Yeah. Now what happened to us and I, they had a field hospital there. So, uh, one time the officers, you know, out the charge of the motor pool, got a hold of a couple of us guys, say, listen, there's a field hospital over there, and I probably told the story at home, but this is what the what happened there. They used to have ice machines at these hospitals run by gasoline engine. It, it was all, all automatic. You push a button, you start the engine, and that made the refrigeration. Mm -hmm. Now, this field hospital belonged to the medic for them. The machine wouldn't work no more because they didn't uh, ma maintain it properly. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So one time uh, the, the officer in charge of the motor pool, the, uh, we used to take care of our trucks, you know, whatever trucks was mm -hmm. inside us. Come over, he says, go, go over there, see what you could do with that, uh, that refrigerator. So myself and this fellow Pete Choke that you see in the picture went over there. We spent about a half a day. What normally you would do to an engine to points, plugs, filters and this and that. Yeah. We got that stupid thing going. And we would, the people that ran that hospital were so appreciative that we had that refrigerator going. They would give us ice. So again, going back to this guy Grundall, he was making ice cream for us <laughs> because we could get the ice. How, how do you make ice cream? Okay, now the, the story about the ice cream, from what I heard, this is all hearsay. Most ships are put out at sea, they got ways of making ice cream, right? Now the guy that was in our outfit, I forget what his title was. Every time he saw a ship come in, he would go down there and bother for things, with the Navy kids. Mm -hmm. And we used to get all their ice cream uh, powder and stuff that you could make ice cream. Oh, okay. And he would bother. We, uh, he would give them some stuff that the sailors wanted from the uh, And we used to get ice cream stuff. But once we had access to ice, we could make ice cream. That's how we get the ice cream. <laughs> We were making ice cream. That's a true story, though. We did make the ice cream. Now, in this form, too, you said you made it possible to have water using a magnet. How'd you do that? Magnet? No. No. The one thing I must... How do I say that? Then? <coughs> Not a magnet. To make a generator? Oh, that part. No, no. It, that's a different story. I'll, I'll get to that story. Okay. But it, be, being in the Army Engineers, some of our guys used to desalinize water. Mm -hmm. On that island of Ai, 
they took one of the companies, and that was their job day and night. They had these machines that were, they would put a, a pipe maybe 40, 50 feet into the ocean, and all the water that we drank or showered with was desalinized from the... Uh, and they used to take that uh, uh, water... They used to have these things that looked like a small swimming pool, you know? Mm -hmm. above the ground, it was made of canvas. They used to put all the water in that, and all the companies that were around used to come to that place and take water from there. Now, part of the 11, 18 engineers, all the time we were on IE, they used to make all the water, not make, but take salt mm -hmm. water and turn it into fresh water. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you end up making the a monument for Ernie Pyle? Could you talk, tell us that story? Well, the, the, naturally, the officers were always in charge of it. They mm -hmm. came over and designed that thing. Mm -hmm. and now, they, you were on the island when he was killed? No, no. We got there after. After? Okay. And when we got on the island, there was that little painted sign. And then our battalion commander, he wanted a, a monument. Mm -hmm. and now, a couple of guys in our outfit, they made the, the form and everything. You look at it. Now, how, how did they make that? You told us before. How did, how did you end up making that form? What was that made of? They, the, the people, just like you would take a form to put concrete mm -hmm. in, they put the... Well, what, what did they make the, the uh, concrete, the mix of? You told us... Yeah, it was... Uh, the mix was made with coral, coral and some other stuff that the army used to supply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the guys that did that, they, they knew how to handle the concrete. Mm -hmm. Now, how did you make the lettering? Why don't you hold this up and show this now? Okay. The lettering, there was a lot of work there. And uh, to get a, there was a lot of us who were interested in it. We, they take these casings and cut them a piece of brass out. and. Uh, now, one of the things, they always had somebody in charge of the thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we made the size and shape that we, we kind of, maybe some of the officers wanted to do it this way or do it that way. We made all those letters. And I was one, one of the guys that stayed there for hours. Not while you were during the day, night, any time you, you had now, to... Now, what did you make the letters from? From the casing from a... Mm -hmm. A little 75 millimeter. Now, how did, how did you do that? What did oh, you do? Oh, we had, being in the motor pool, we had tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, what, did you flatten the shell out? Oh, maybe? yes, everything, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Tell us step by step. Why don't, yeah, why don't you go into more detail? How did, exactly how you did that? It, it, how it, did you get the round shell and make it flat? Uh, if I had to tell you exactly what we did, we, we did get it flat and put a, uh, 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 what do you call this? Uh, a cardboard. Uh, 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 what do you call that when you make a template? Of every oh, letter. a pattern? A pattern, pattern of every letter. Mm -hmm. We knew what many letters done. When they got us uh, a lot of guys interested in, some of us guys did put a lot of work on that. And I happen to be, not personally, but one of the guys. Mm -hmm. Now, I always like to tell the story about that grass. Okay. Okay, can, can you hold that up again? Hold, hold it still, yeah. Let me just focus in on it for a second. Now, you're on the, you're on the right, you're right. Yes. Okay. That's me. On the and right. who's the other gentleman? The other, the, he's a young man, see? Mm -hmm. I was 25, 26. Okay. He was only about 19. Which Pete thing? Choke. Came from uh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, tell us about the grass. How, how did you get yeah, the grass? Yeah, so we went, uh, they decided to do the grass, and they got this photo. I gotta find that picture. Anyway, we went to the island, maybe they were gonna go look for grass today, mm -hmm. and bring some kind of container, put all those little grass clumps that would grow around there. Mm -hmm. But that whole island was nothing but coral. You dug a little ways and there was coral. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was able to make that and look like grass. Look was grass. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But he cultivated enough, watered enough to make it grow nice. So he, he was 
He was worked in Nova. landscaping. In before. landscaping when he lived, when he was a civilian. Civilian, okay. Young man. All right. Now, how about how long did it take to make that monument? I bet it took us at least a month or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we put a lot of work into that. And after it was all built and everything, they had a dedication to it. They got a lot of soldiers from the Army uh, Band and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but this is later on uh, that I'm standing there with the... Mm -hmm. That's after it was dedicated? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, the one thing maybe uh, you'd be interested in is the island of Aishima. When the war ended, they, fixed, they made it so the Japanese came with their planes, landed on that airfield, and they switched to American planes that went to see MacArthur. So all the Japanese Air Force that was left landed on a... Not the, the, the Air Force. They, those planes came special there with the envoys on them. Oh, it. oh, they're okay. With the envoys. They're, they're the diplomats and the leaders of leaders, Japan. Leaders, right. Oh, now, okay. The one thing that I knew about it, that morning that, that those planes was to come in, I think they came in with four smaller planes. I don't know if I find them. And they got in two of our bigger planes. They were taken to MacArthur. And uh, some place in, uh, in, in uh, the Philippines, I think, is where they signed that tr treaty. They signed in the Tokyo Bay. But, I don't know where. Yeah, but the, but then, what I know about it, being mm -hmm. in the army, being, one day that we get orders, we all got dressed up and we had a line. The day that those planes came in, they had GIs r ring the whole field, just in civilian, not civilian clothes, mm -hmm. army clothes. Mm -hmm. When those guys got off the plane, they, all they saw, they had to see the plane come in, all GIs all around that field. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to get up there that morning and wait till they came. Hmm. We could see them too. You know, you couldn't be that far. That time. right, right. Yeah. Now, how long were you on Aishima? <sighs> About. Uh, I bet we went at least five, six months. Mm -hmm. We're we're. Now. Um, did you, you said you had a fungus on your hands, did you, oh, where did yeah. you get that? Oh yeah, I was that? in the Philippines. Philippines? I had a, such a bad fungus on my hands, I was ashamed to go and eat. They used to put that purple stuff on you. You know, that, that fungus never left me until I started coming home. Hmm. We got on the Pacific again on a small ship. That's the only thing I suffered from. Hmm. Well, then, uh, why don't you mention to them about the occupying force when you went into... Okay. Yeah, that's right. Now, one of the things that happened to my outfit, they... Here, they, I can take that from you. Yeah. You see, now, you got to... When the, when the treaty was signed, mm -hmm. we were supposed to go over to Japan to occupy as an occup occupation force. Mm -hmm. But we got hit by a big typhoon out there. I don't know if it's in history. Yeah, I think it was off the coast of Okinawa. There was a huge typhoon. Typhoon. Mm -hmm. The only thing I could say about this, my 11, 18 engineers, we were on two small ships, all ready to go up for occupation force. And those ships got, they uh, broke up the convoy. They, all the ships were anchored. They, they were all beached. Mm -hmm. I got some pictures someplace, and uh, I didn't get to go to Okinawa with uh, the, most of the guys that came from my outfit. We got later, we got split up. When I got to get to Japan, they put us up to part the guys that I was with in Curie Naval Base. It was supposed to be the equivalent to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I don't know if you mm -hmm. follow it for me. Mm -hmm. In the size, 
and we were there in uh, about two or three months in Curie. Now, when we were in, in uh, Japan, my outfit was like, but most of us guys who had been there the longest, and we had uh, enough points, some of us, we would have to get up in the morning and wait for certain orders to get ready to go back, to come back to the States. Now, while you were in Japan, what things did you do there? In Japan, when we were at Curie Naval Base, it was there, uh, uh, it was belonged to, belonged to the Japanese. Right. They had the Japanese working, doing all the work. We didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. We used to get up in the morning, exercise, have breakfast, and hang around. Now, one of the stories that happened to me there, I don't know if I find that picture. Uh, this one. Okay. One. Yeah. They took us to, this is a Hiroshima mm -hmm. City Hall. Mm -hmm. If you hold it for Wayne to see. This Hiroshima City Hall. I'm a co company commander. Okay, got Anybody want to go okay. see? He, he focused on it already. I got it. Anybody want to go to Hiroshima? So we went. Mm -hmm. They took us there by army truck from Curie Naval Base. We got to see that. Uh, what was your reaction when you got there and actually saw the, the okay. devastation? Okay. Now, my interpretation, I'm a smart aleck. The building was a beautiful building. <clears throat> I remember a beautiful sta marble staircase. What the atom bomb did, there were no windows or no thing that was, could disintegrate in place. Only the mortar was in place, you follow me? Mm -hmm. The bricks weren't touched. Now, I like to tell this story. I'm a storyteller. If you look in the corner here, and I got my thumb. There's a low fire station. Oh, okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. So being in the motor pool, being interested in we walked around, and I walked to where the fire engines was. Now think, of, see if you guys could understand what I'm going to say. Did you ever see a tire break, the old-fashioned tires, mm -hmm. where they had a little rim of wire around oh, it? Oh, yeah. 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 All the tires on those fire, whatever fire equipment they had, all disintegrated and the bead, the iron bead was still on there. Those trucks never left the station. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. They took us there by like a convoy and they, they ringed the city with the truck. They we went all around that Hiroshima. Now, one of the things that happened, yeah, you figure on the truck, each truck had maybe about 20, 30 guys, 20, 24 guys. We got, we're looking all over this building, and we find a guy dressed in civilian clothes. Now, here's a story, that, now I'm relating, there's like a fish story now. The guy spoke good English. He said he came from California, he was Japanese, and he said that he got caught visiting Ch uh, Japan. What did I say, Chinese? No, he said Japanese. Japanese. That he had left America to go there on some kind of business to mm -hmm. Japan, and the war started. Now he couldn't get back. And he was telling us how the bomb was dropped. He said, the American planes, they had a routine. They would get to the Hiroshima about 8 o'clock in the morning. The sirens would go off that there was enemy. Mm -hmm. And uh, these planes would come in. The atom bomb was actually dropped on parachutes, you know. Mm -hmm. That was not a bomb. It was, and the Japanese people would come out and see these and what was being dropped was leaflets telling them that something bad would happen to them, blah, 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 whatever. 
the Americans wanted them to hear. He didn't. So what happened, by the third or fourth morning when the plane had the atom bomb, they didn't know what was going to be in there. When the atom bomb go, went off, they were nowhere near shelters. They were all out in the open. Mm -hmm. They saw these things coming down, thinking that uh, leaflets were going to come down. And the atom bomb went off. And what I saw about that, that building looked nice and solid, but any window, no windows left, no anything that was made uh, out of, uh, to my opinion, wood, mm -hmm. wasn't there no more. The, uh, the, where the firehouse was, the tires off the fire equipment wasn't there no more. That's uh, my, uh, my uh, that I saw, mm -hmm. that I remember and I think about. Did you ever have any uh, encounters with the Japanese people while you were there no. in Japan? Yeah, like Outside I said, well, when we were occupying there, we had a lot of time off. <clears throat> the company command always tried to get us something to do, but uh, not. Uh, we never. I never went in any store or anything mm -hmm. like that. No, mm -hmm. we we saw some of their streets. Now this is. Whatever uh, civilians, uh, Japanese, lived around a Curie naval base. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing. I was there maybe a couple of weeks waiting to get the orders to come home. Mm -hmm. Then they put us on some trains and they traveled about three days to get to, I, I can't think of the name. They, when we came back, there was about 500 of us guys. They put us on transport uh, ship, cargo ships, and they took us back to uh, Seattle. That's where we started from. That's why we came back. Mm -hmm. Were you discharged as soon as you got back? Uh, th this was interesting because we got back, had to be the month of November, only because they asked us guys if any of us didn't want to fly back to Fort Dix. Uh, most of us took the planes back, mm -hmm. and the planes were these two engine ships that the, we had a lot of them, two engine truck mm -hmm. propeller, mm -hmm. made about three or four stops from Seattle to Fort Dix. Not the, what's the, what's the airfield near Fort Dix. But anyway, every time they landed someplace, they would throw another box of sandwiches and then it was a turkey sandwich. We get to Fort Dix and they give us a big turkey dinner. Mm -hmm. And I got home by Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. From the time, I don't know when they... Now, did your parents know you were coming home? No. I didn't call them until I got to Seattle. Mm -hmm. So then, the best I could tell them, I'll be home in three or four days. And then from Fort Dix, it was easy for us to get home. They processed out of, I had some papers someplace, mm -hmm. discharge papers. Now, after you left the service, did you make use of the GI Bill at all? No. <clears throat> I tried, but uh, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Did you join any veterans organizations ever? Not right away. Uh, later on, when I moved, to my, I had a family by then. We left, I left. Now, were you married before you went into service? No. Okay. I married at that company. Mm -hmm. They were, you were born in 50, right there? Brother was born in 50. I was born in 55. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I, I never went to mm -hmm. any schools or anything like that. Did you ever use the 5220 club? I tried. I got about two or three weeks out of it. And the guy I had there right away, he. You let us say, what do you guys you want to take advantage of? You know, that that kind of an attitude. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to be honest with myself. I got to give credit where it's due. What I did learn in the Army from being in the motor pool and the low, uh, what they try to teach us how to keep trucks running, mm -hmm. I try to come home and try to be a mechanic and I. Got jobs where I try to be an automobile mechanic. That's what I made a living at. Mm -hmm. 
Be more specific. Huh? Be more specific. Well, the ones, see the, see the picture you see me on the motorcycle? Yep, that's, we've okay. got to show that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now. When was that taken? Okay. <coughs> this was taken, uh, I'd have to look. When I got to go to the 1118 engineers, mm -hmm. I go there, their motor, we were, Stationed on the uh, yeah in the, the barracks of the the state troopers. The the, the officer who was in charge of the motor pool. So I need two volunteers to go to the motorcycle factory. So uh, you know you never volunteer to go any place. Mm -hmm. So one of the soldiers that came from. What was that town when I used to come to see you in Massachusetts? Uh, Framingham. Framingham. Oh, Framingham. The big city. Worcester? Worcester. There was a guy who lived in Worcester, he was stationed with us in Framingham. So he he got a hold of me. He was in the motor pool. He's down there. Why don't you volunteer to go? Uh, so finally, I talked to the officer in charge of the motor pool. I said, I'll, I'll volunteer. So right away, they, Take you with the well, what for? Why is it volunteering now? So anyway, I I could get to the Bronx when my family swore. <laughs> now was that the Indian motorcycle? That factory? at at Springfield, Mass. They had their factory there. Mm -hmm. So I spent about three or four months at the Indian motorcycle factory. Now, one of the things that happened to oh, me... Oh, you worked on motorcycles there? Learned they, how to they, work they, on them? They taught us. <clears throat> they would take a motorcycle apart and explain to us what was going on. Oh, okay. Now, I learned a lot about gasoline engines, a little bit about the generators and starters. Although they didn't have... Uh, uh, they had generators on it, but they didn't have a starter. You had to mm -hmm. crank it. And I went to... Indian Motorcycle Factory. We used to do sometime in classroom settings and sometimes right at the factory. Now these guys they used to talk to us, the you know, the war was still going, just started. Now the idea is I always like to put in my two cents. The motorcycles that we left in Framingham were Harley Davidson's. So they take us to the motorcycle factory. Now that motorcycle, according to these guys that were teaching us, was designed especially by people in the, the engineers for army use. Mm -hmm. It was a, 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 a side, they tried to explain it to us. So that's how come I went to the Indian motorcycle. Then after the class was over, they, they took pictures of all of us put you on a motorcycle, sent it to your hometown newspaper. That's where that picture was. Oh, okay. That picture was sent to the Bronx Home News. So that was in what, 42, 43, after, somewhere? After there? the war was over. Oh, after the war was over? Yeah. Okay. Now, the picture, no, the war was still on. I'm sorry. To yeah, the answer. But <clears throat> being that they had the two motorcycles at uh, 1118 Engineers, but I never got to work on them. So, mm -hmm. Right after I got out of the motorcycle school, they got rid of the motorcycles. <laughs> but they were Harley Davidson, they weren't Indians. Uh -huh. Now, did, when you got out of the service, did you ride a motorcycle? I bought one that needed repair. Uh -huh. <laughs> Tell them that story to keep yeah. I, I, I go to a gas station where I used to do. There was a motorcycle on the side. It needed some work. So I guess I bought it for about $25. So I got it running. So I take the motorcycle home, and uh, we, my family, my father, mother, I bought a, a house in the Bronx, and we all lived in. My sister had Raymond was only a baby, so I go stop the motorcycle, and I scared the shit out of Raymond. <laughs> and my mother got a hold of me. She says, "Get rid of that motorcycle." <laughs> so I sold it right away. Wow. 
See, if he had it now, it'd be worth a fortune. <laughs> uh, it's an old Indian motorcycle. Uh, but I got it. Well, I got it working. Yeah. Now, did you after after you left the service, did you stay in contact with any of your friends? For example, like uh, what was his name, no, Peter? He, no, he used to send me a Christmas card every year, till about two, three years ago. Uh -huh. So you stayed in contact at least till then. Yeah. Did you ever have any reunions or anything? Not with my outfit. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. But then, uh, one of the guys I worked with, with the, I finally, I, I, I got to say this, the little bit I learned from the Indian Motorcycle Factory mm -hmm. and a little bit I learned at the Heavy Equipment School in Fort Belvoir, I was able to pass the city test in New York City for the uh, and I got a job as a mechanic in the sanitation garage. Mm -hmm. So that's where you worked after the war then? Yeah, I, put, I worked in uh, for the city 26 and a half years. I worked in one garage, one building, 23 years and never left. They must have named it after you. No, <laughs> but that's true. I, I, I made most of my living from that city. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got this is a question I usually ask. Uh, you already kind of answered it. How do you think your time in the army had an effect or changed your life? Very lucky. Mm -hmm. Because I'll tell you why. Because uh, when I was a teenager, I, we couldn't drive in New York City until you got 18. Mm -hmm. Now, my parents, my father couldn't even write English. He never learned how to drive a car, nothing. But <laughs> us guys. You know what we used to do in the city to try to get a car to learn how to drive? We used to teach each other. They used to go rent a car. <laughs> Did you believe this? Hmm. You know how dangerous that was? On a weekend, somebody would get a bunch of guys together and go rent a car. And then we try to teach each other how to drive. Did anyone know how to drive? Well, you always had somebody to try to teach you. You know, when you think about it. Stupid guys, but, but we did it. <laughs> Dominic has always been in love with the car. I think he said that's his first love. Yeah. Listen, I, I'll be honest with you. A lot of, I hate it to say it this way. I never smoked because any money I had, I used to make friends with guys that had jalopies <clears throat> and hang out with them, put gas in the car. A big thing was to get enough gas in the car to take a ride uh, to park in the uh, uh, S S Central, Central, Central Park. We used to go in there on 10th Street, go all the way down to 59th. That was a big thing for us, the guys. Mm -hmm. The first car I ever bought, the only reason I bought it, because I was very friendly with a, a good you know, you, you know, as you grow up, you become buddies with somebody. His name was to Tony Mordenti. And uh, we bought that car together so I could teach him how to drive. That's a true story. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm down East Harlem, if I could explain this a little bit, which is today what they call Spanish Harlem. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yes. That whole area was a little thing there for all Italian people. And I learned, uh, then after I got my license, only because the guy I worked for was an Italian banker who used to deliver Italian bread. We used to deliver bread with a car. A lot of people who used to leave Manhattan go to the Bronx. To, they upgraded their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And we used to deliver Italian bread from Manhattan to the Bronx. But I, I, I love cars. Then I started trying to get jobs working in small repair shops until I got to work with the city. Do you still work on cars at all? No, no more. God, 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 he got away from me. But when they were, when they were growing up, I was working on cars. I bought cars I couldn't afford because of my father. <laughs> you know, a couple of my boys, they, they, I, 
I changed uh, uh, Volkswagen Motors for them. <laughs> you know. The best story was uh, when you dropped that transmission for me that day. Oh, he's living in Massachusetts. So he needed a clutch in a Volvo. So we was parking the car in the yeah, garage. Yeah, park, park. And, and I live in Brookline. Uh -huh. And in Brookline, to live there, you had to find a place to park your car. Mm -hmm. So it was not necessarily next to your apartment or home. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to work. I'm a freelance photographer. I had an assignment. I said, Dad, wait for me. When, we, when I get back, we'll drop the transmission. Well, I get back, he's already got the transmission dropped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a tough job. That was one of the... But I, my family, after I got home from the service, I took care of all the, the cars and the, mm -hmm. my brother-in-laws, my brothers. That was my job. I, I used to love to work on cars. But that's... Uh, but I, I got to admit, you asked me a question. What did I get out of this? I'm lucky. I, with the... The little uh, instructions I had mm -hmm. from the Army and from the motorcycle factory, I could, uh, you know, an engine is an engine, but not today. Today they got old. Mm -hmm. But I did a lot of work on cars after the war. Mm -hmm. The cute the thing is, it's hard to explain. I got a job with a local guy used to repair cars. You couldn't believe after the war the cars that the guys used to try to have fixed so that they could have a car. Then another thing, we used to go to all the junkyards and pick up used parts. Um, I know you don't like to talk about the medals you received and as to why. No. I know you're ashamed of what you should have I don't know, they gave me... Uh, I noticed you received a bronze star. Bronze oh, star. What, why did you receive that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. One of the things... Just woke up one day and it was there, right? No, no, the guy said, you see that thing about the, the company commander sending us to that field hospital to start that? Mm -hmm. I tell you, I was lucky. I, the, Pete and myself, we got looked at that thing and studied it enough to get it going. Now that thing used to stop by itself. And then we had all the ice we could want to use. Mm -hmm. I thought that was cute. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. Yeah. Thank you. But uh, if anything, I uh, have to thank the, my ability to, to learn enough from the Army that when I went to work for the city, I was able to pass that mechanics test. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I had picked up a, a... I worked for a diamond tea dealer, diamond tea truck. I worked for them a couple of years. That gave me a little more. Uh, but the, that, the old fashioned car was easy to work on compared mm -hmm. to what you have today. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>